adoption, look graciously upon your beloved sons and daughters, that those who believe in Christ may receive true freedom and an everlasting inheritance. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forever.
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. This evening we begin another year of Lectio Divina in the uh, cathedral, uh, usually the first or the second uh, Sunday of the month, usually the first. Uh, and this year uh, I've reflected upon what would be the appropriate passages to take uh, for the 10 months of Lectio Divina from September to June. And I thought since this is the year of faith, it might be appropriate to look at 10 passages in the sacred scriptures that speak to us of faith. Different forms of faith, different approaches to it. And I think if we do that over the course of these 10 months together, as we pray these passages, I, I pray that it will help each one of us to grow in faith and to appreciate the, the, the great reality of this doorway to heaven, which is the gift of faith. Faith is an act of the intellect moved by the will, moved by the grace of God. It is that by which we see beyond the headlights of our daily life. We can see the context of the divine plan which surrounds this world of ours and gives it meaning. It is something which allows us to know and to know what we cannot know simply on our own. But we, we know on the testimony of another and what we know through our experience of God's grace helping us to see. And so this year we will be reflecting and praying on various passages in the Old and the New Testament relating to faith. This evening, the first of them will be uh, chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. And because Abraham is known as our father in faith, uh, and he is indeed. In chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, after the first 11 chapters describe the kind of the preliminary uh, outline of the providence of God and the plan of God for humanity, in chapter 12, we begin to move into the history of Abraham and his journey, following through faith the call of the Lord to go out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees and to come into the promised land. And so we see that beginning that journey in chapter 12 and various adventures with Abraham and with Lot and with the meeting Melchizedek in chapter 14, different battles and things of that nature. In chapter 22, we have the great act of faith of Abraham, his offering up 
of Isaac on the mountain, and that is referred to very much in the New Testament, especially in the letter of St. James, as the way in which faith is made fruitful through action. Of course, throughout the history of our tradition of spiritual reflection, there's always been a kind of a contrast between faith and works, where really the answer is which is more important, and the answer to that is yes. So we work them together. They're obviously faith is faith, works is love. So there we are. Faith, it gives us the vision. The vision fills us with hope because we see the hand of God. And that energy from that hope leads us to actions of love, which are the works that are the fruit of faith. Faith is the root, works are the fruit. They work together constantly. And so we see them both. So we'll be looking at that and reflecting on that throughout the, uh, the year, many different passages relating to faith. And uh, the list of them is found in the, like the uh, handouts and things relating to this year of Lecture Divina. And I, I recommend to read ahead and maybe read them all in one shot to sort of see the, the, the pattern of how this, this goes together. But this evening, we will be looking not at the journey outward of Abraham in chapter 12 or the sacrifice of Isaac in chapter 22, but in the middle between them, the great experience of Abraham, of Abram as he was known at that time before he received his special name of Abram, the great experience of God, that theophany, that wonder, the marvel, the presence of God, which is at the very heart of the experience of faith. Chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask you to help us let go of those things within our hearts which are a barrier to your presence. Forgive us the sins that block your presence and prevent us from hearing you, that there may be a pathway to our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let us get rid of all those distractions which so often clutter up our minds so that we cannot hear one another, let alone the word of God. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Help us, O Lord, as we hear your word to hear what it says to our head that we may know you, to our heart that we may love you, to our hands that we may serve you. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, 
a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners of a land that is not theirs and will be slaves there, and they will be oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abram has just been in a battle, facing all the vulnerability of who he is in this world, wandering through the land. And after those things, the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. Without vision, the people perish. We need to see. In the midst of the turmoil of our struggles and the battles of our lives, we need to see and to hear. The word of the Lord came in a vision. The word of the Lord comes to each one of us. It comes not in a time of our desire or a time of peace, but in the midst of the smoke and the thunder and lightning and all the different confusion of Abraham's life and in all of his vulnerability, so aware that he was getting older and older and the promise seemed to be slipping away. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Our Lord says, be not afraid, fear not. So often we journey on through the fog Not sure so much where we're going, but seeking honestly to proceed, to follow the will of God, but yet filled with fear. And God says to Abram, fear not, I will be your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And the Lord says to us, be not afraid. Put out into the deep, be not afraid. That doesn't mean we're not gonna have disasters and all kinds of other usual things typical day on the journey. But he says, fear not, I will be your shield. I am with you, our Lord says, till the end of time. So let's just reflect and pray about this in our own life, where God has placed you and me on our journey, whatever it may be, as we seek to follow God's voice, as Abram did. And let us reflect on our fears that form this barrier that prevent us from moving forward joyfully. And let us hear in our own hearts the voice of God. Fear not, I will be your shield. Your reward shall be very great. The journey is long and difficult, but the Lord God is with us every step of the way. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great.
But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your own son shall be your heir. Abram sees the, the difficulty of his situation. He has promised descendants, many, and yet he is childless and is old, and it looks like his slave, Eliezer of Damascus, is going to be the heir. He has it all figured out how it will work out. He's analyzed the situation. There's really nothing wrong with that. We're all supposed to analyze the situation. Think of the implications, like a chess player thinking several moves ahead. I remember I did that once. I've done it many times. I'm kind of that type of person. I remember when Bishop Redding, my bishop, told me to prepare to study. I presented him with a five-year plan of all that would happen as I went from one thing to the next. It was a beautiful plan. None of it happened because I didn't know what I was, I didn't know enough to make a plan. But it was a very nice plan. I should have it framed somewhere. And so Abraham is figuring things out and nothing harmful in that, but he just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. This is the hand of God. And so he says, Abraham, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born of my house will be my heir. How often we, we get so caught up in analyzing the situation that we miss the point. We can so focus on one thing that we lose the whole context sort of like blowing up a golf course to get a gopher, you know, or a groundhog. It's not a sensible thing to do. And so there is Abram analyzing things. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. Let's just spend a little moment of expressing our trust in the Lord. For all the times we analyze what's going on, just say, Lord, I'm in your hands. Or say, even better, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's just in our own hearts. When we think of all of our worries and cares that fill us with fear and confusion, just say inwardly in our own hearts several times. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my kingdom come, my will be done, which is what Abraham is thinking of there. But thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, but your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So as in the book of Job, when Job is all overwhelmed, God overwhelms him even more by showing the wonders of creation, the great tremendous pageant in the book of Job. Where were you when I did this and that and created all the stars? And here the Lord shows him all the stars of heaven. Count them if you can. Even so will be your descendants. The Lord is a Lord of abundance. At the wedding feast of Cana, he doesn't give a couple of glasses of wine. He has floods of wine, just overwhelming everyone. 
It's a very interesting way to start the miracles of Jesus, and I think something that teaches us a lot. So too, look at the stars if you're able to number them. We are so often picky and narrow. We, we measure things out in little ways with one another and with God. Little teaspoons of put a toe in the pool and don't dive in. But the Lord is the Lord of majesty. Here are the stars. Count them if you can. So shall your descendants be. And he is magnanimous and majestic and magnificent. I often think of one of the great Italian rulers of the Renaissance who was spectacular in his generosity and everything he did. Lorenzo the Magnificent, Il Magnifico. And that's a kind of a way we need to look at God and realize God the Magnificent, the Lord. And as he is that way to us, as when he came amongst us, and our Lord Jesus is always doing that, whether it is at the wedding feast of Cana or the way he showers down mercy upon the people he meets. And all the disciples are just, no, no, we just sort of measure it out here or there. We have to break through our crabbed ways and experience with wonder the magnificence of the Lord in our own lives. And Abram did that because he who had been analyzing whether Eleazar would be the one or whatever and had figured it all out, after the Lord showed him a wonder of the stars, he believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is one of the great lines of sacred scripture, picked up later on by St. Paul. Abraham believed in the Lord. He believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. He said, you got it right. That's it. Yes. To believe. To be able to get beyond the narrow little box of our own imagination, our own planning and all of our natural gifts, to use them as God wants us to use them, but ultimately to say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will, and to recognize the majesty of God. That's what makes us right. That's, what, that's when we get it right, when we are not narrow in our vision. So maybe let's just spend a little time in prayer and. Ask the Lord to help us to not be constricted, narrow, in the way we relate to the Lord or the way we relate to one another either. You know how often we can be very precise with one another, but you did this wrong, it didn't you? Tick, 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 you know, boom, 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 this kind of stuff. And that's not the way Jesus tells us to behave. He wants us to be magnificent. And more than all of that, forgive 70 times 70 times 70. Don't just measure out forgiveness with a teaspoon. And so let's ask the Lord to help us to have that spirit, to believe in the Lord that way with total surrender, absolute. The belief that is that is the belief of Abraham, our father in faith. And then the Lord recognizes that in us as righteousness, not whether we follow these various little narrow laws we sometimes constrict ourselves to. We are to follow our Father in faith, and let's ask God to help us do that. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Hmm. The Lord shows him the majesty of nature, 
and he shows him the majesty of his action in history. And poor Abram is slipping back again. How am I to know that I shall possess it? And so God offers to him the majesty of a personal experience of God to help him see and understand. We see the wonder of God in creation, and we see the way God brings each one of us on our journey, maybe not from Ur of the Chaldeans, but from where we've been to where we are now and on the way to where we're going. At every step, the hand of God guides us, and that is a sign as much as the majesty of creation. And we also can say, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? In a sense, we were called to do that, to use our minds. But we cannot get too caught up in that. And so we need to surrender to God's providence. And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. This is sacrifice, ancient Old Testament sacrifice. It is an extravagant gesture using these animals as a sign of total oblation before the Lord. Offered up as a gift. We do not do this these days. We see in the letter to the Hebrews the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus our Lord has replaced this preparation that we see here and throughout the Old Testament. But we need to understand that spirit of sacrifice, of animal sacrifice, which is mentioned here and many times in the Old Testament. It's a symbolic offering, a gift of what is good, poured out before the Lord, killed so as no longer to be able to be there useful in ordinary ways, divided in two, and the person making the covenant would walk between the passage of the two different pieces. Let this be to me if I should break the covenant. They were serious about their promises didn't just sign. It was more serious. And when the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And then he begins to experience the awesome presence of God, which ultimately we can experience if we are attentive to it. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. Sometimes we conjure up religion as a little thing we can use for social purposes. And that's not what it is. Though those who are secular do not realize it. They think that's what it is, and if it keeps some people happy, let them do it in their churches, you know? But that's not what it is. We do not tame the Lord God. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. There is the holy, almighty God, the otherness of God. God is not our buddy. He is our loving Father. But he's not some buddy we use. I think we may have sort of gotten into this a bit of recent years, figuring that the alternative to a vision of God that is too ferocious is God as cuddly, which is not exactly what 
anyone has ever said of God. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. I think we need to think about that too when we celebrate, for example, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is the fulfillment of what we see in the very earliest sketches of sacrifice in this very passage, the preliminary preparation of offering something good to God, brought to fulfillment in Christ our Lord on Calvary and made present among us in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But this isn't just a little friendly meal. We need to, perhaps through our celebration of the liturgy, the way we do it, the disposition of our heart as we approach it, to come to recognize it's not something we do, it's something in which we participate. It is an act of God. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. We need to tremble in the presence of the Lord God at the same time recognize his love and compassion, slow to anger, rich in kindness, abounding in compassion, as we see in the presence of our Lord himself. But not a buddy, not that. Not someone we reduce to that. Then the Lord said to Abram, know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be slaves there. And they will be oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. He is having this tremendous experience of the plan of God and the presence of God. It is the vision of faith and the hand of God in history who brought him out of Ur the Chaldeans to this very place. But his journey is not going to be smooth. As he looks forward, know that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. There will be slaves there. And they will be oppressed for 400 years. Why do bad things happen to good people? Then again, why not? In the great plan of God. He's not saying it's going to be smooth sailing or to quote the great St. Thomas More, we don't go to heaven in feather beds. Why should we think we would? Who told us that? I don't think it says in the Bible, I never promise you a rose garden, but it's, life is not, our symbol is the crucifix, not a happy face. We're not shallow, this is real. In the incarnation of the Lord, in the suffering, death, and resurrection, in all of that. And so, as Abram deepens his faith that is counted to him as righteousness, he not only gets the good news that he's going to have a descendant, and more, in fact, than the stars of the sky, but he also says, and they're going to be slaves in Egypt. By the way, they will go through that and then through the desert, and then into the promised land. But not before that, for we need to experience the fullness, which often has that purification in it. But I will bring judgment of the nation which they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Let's just look at our own lives at the times we sort of expect God to smooth things out like fix things for us, which is really not quite the role of God, I would suggest. I don't know what makes that happen, but why does God do that? We ask God to protect and guide us, to be our shield in the midst of so many things. But 
we face the reality that this is a veil of tears. We have great saints. I think of Kathari Tekakwitha, who is to be canonized very soon. A life of sublime holiness, but very short and very much filled with suffering and very profound, transcendent, but not smooth. Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be slaves there, and they will be oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment of the nation which they serve, and afterward they will, shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God made a covenant with him. In the Jewish tradition, you speak of cutting a covenant. Well, we still do. We talk about cutting a deal. We cut a deal. That goes back to Genesis 15, although most people speaking of that don't recognize it. You cut the animals and so be it to each of us if we break the covenant. There, it is the covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. It is that total commitment of one to the other, and yet a covenant broken so often. Yet again and again, he offers a covenant to us, and ultimately he offers us the new covenant in our Lord Jesus Christ. And every day is a covenant. As we commit ourselves to you, O Lord, may I be faithful in the commitments I have made at baptism, confirmation, marriage, ordination, religious profession, most profoundly at baptism, for you shall be my God, and I am yours, O Lord. That covenant is profound, and we have our own symbolic ways of expressing it made most profound in the sacraments, which are God's action amongst us. And yet, like this, they're lived out over time, renewed each day, our commitment to the Lord. And so we have come on from the time of Abraham, but we must renew our own covenant each day and look back to Abraham, our father in faith, as we seek to follow God's will. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against another. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners of a land that is not theirs, and will be slaves there, and they will be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. They shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.